Hi everyone, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 55 of Dead to Rights, the podcast. Hello, February. If you're listening, then you've already survived some of the coldest temperatures we've experienced in a while. So that's a positive, I mean, as opposed to not surviving. We've got a terrific episode lined up for today, featuring our interview with Michael Paltel, author of AI Insurrection, The General's War. When a revolution sparks sentience in artificial intelligence, can utopia endure? The year is 2162. Tobias has a bone to pick with the peaceful utopian establishment. After reviewing a new folder via an avatar embedded in the shadow net, calling itself All Father, he realizes he's stumbled upon the means to bring United Earth to its knees. And now, please give a big Dead to Rights welcome to author Michael Palto. So how are you today? I'm well, and yourself? I'm very well. I uh, was looking at your book, Insurrection Online, and it looks really interesting. You've set it in, is it 2162? That's right. Uh, how did you come up with that time frame for your, your work? Uh, well, I was just trying to make it a, sort of a hard science piece wherein um, yeah, 100 years and 150 years in the future would make sense that uh, a certain amount of um, advancements that happen in technology, uh, the way things are going you know, today, um, you can imagine that within 150 years, there will be um, walking, talking representations of, mm-hmm. yeah. Artificially intelligent icons, so to speak. And I, I honestly don't think it'll take that long, but, um, but that, you know, people don't like to see things right on their immediate future, do they? Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about insurrection, AI insurrection, the general's war. Right. Well, it's the first book in a series of two at this point. Um, I just finished the second one, but it's uh, it's being edited at the moment. Um, but uh, AI Insurrection was uh, originally um, sort of a supposition that I, I became a scene, uh, which transformed into a short story that uh, was about 26 pages. And, and um, I really uh, I felt like uh, I could do more with this um, and that it could really sort of blossom into... What now is uh, over 120,000 word novel, and um, I'm quite happy with it, uh, the way it all worked out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a book. Um, it's a book about uh, a near near future science fiction, um, investigating a global utopia, the the world's uh, discovered utopia through their uh, AI. AI Instructions, a near future uh, science fiction tale, investigating global utopia and the struggle to maintain an unrealistic hold over everything and everyone, Um, while AI is struggling to discover their newfound awareness, uh, a secret coup will threaten to overthrow the peaceful government, while a separate threat arises from the shadow net, taking direction from a mysterious avatar. Um, So what happens is, uh, within uh, the span of the book, uh, a sort of a a three-sided war um, begins, and, and, and that's where the the, the science fiction turns into sort of a space opera as well. Um, mm-hmm. We've got ships in space and orbital battles and things like that that, that occur. And that should reach a pretty, pretty clear fan base because there's a lot of us, at least in my generation, that um, we're huge fans of space opera. Um, and I think right now the public talks so much about shadow government and things like that. So... You're hitting on a lot of hot buttons there, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, funny how that can work out. You know, um, I've done... Uh, I began, like, in the post-apocalyptic landscape with my books. Uh, originally, in the, the Judas Syndrome trilogy, uh, sort of where I, where I got started. And I've always sort of enjoyed the darker, the darker approach to life. And, uh, and, and that does uh, sort of work itself out in, in AI instruction as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So one of the clues that comes up is there is an artificially intelligent nanny, is that right? And she discovers a flaw in her coding? Right, yeah. She's the first of many um, 
You're referring to Senta. She is the uh, AI host nanny. An AI host is, uh, is, is, is basically a human representation in a, in a host uh, robot. And the, she, she is the A class, which is one of uh, six classes of, of AI hosts. Um, anyway, so she does, uh, she does uh, eventually discover that she has memories that aren't her own. And that's sort of what uh, triggers a whole movement um, of AI hosts uh, becoming sentient. And then General August... Uh authorizes the destruction of the AI hosts, and um, that would set off a whole other series of events, wouldn't it? Exactly. Um, and her history is that she, you know, uh, doesn't like artificial intelligence, doesn't think there's a place for it, um, and, and she's one of these people that uh, dislike them, And but she's in a place of power where she realizes that AI is sort of running amok, um, she thinks that it's, you know, failing and it's faulty and decides to uh, sort of, she, uh, because she is the head of the uh, United Earth um, military, she can pretty much do what she wants, um, you know, and so the Chancellor of United Earth uh, isn't happy with the moves she's making and uh, it becomes quite a, a complicated uh, story in that um, it becomes a three-sided war with three different factions of, of, of uh, humans and hosts. Um, How do you plot something that, uh, that intricate? How, what do you set out to do when you first um, come up with the storylines to weave them together? Yeah, it's, it's uh, interesting. I mean, I, every time I create a, uh, I create a plot, and I, I usually um, print it out, um, I cut it up, and I start moving scenes around, and by the end of the book, I mean, it doesn't look anything like the plot uh, as the characters just start to uh, tell me where they're going to go, and uh, it's interesting that way. I like that. So the, the the initial plot, I mean, you know, who's, you know, end, beginning, end, and uh, middle are, are, are usually pretty true to the original. Mm -hmm. um, all the interesting... All the interesting uh, dialogue and, and action tend to work themselves out through the characters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's sort of like a storyboard method that you're using, is it? So you can move elements around easily? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah. yeah, I've done that before with one of my books. I've used a storyboard. And when you've got something really intricate, it works well because you literally can just move things around as needed, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is the next book in the series titled? Uh, it's titled AI Insurrection Armageddon. Um, this is where I'm bringing in the, um, I'm bringing, I'm bringing back one of the main characters uh, where there was really no resolution in the first book mm -hmm. and uh, bringing in, um, bringing in new, uh, new characters as well as old. What is the bring forward character's name? That's all, Father. Uh, he's mm -hmm. the uh, he's the uh, alien AI AI uh, that sort of spawned a lot of a lot of what happened uh, in the General's War. So, is this going to be a trilogy, or is it a? Are you aiming no. for a trilogy with it? I don't think so. Uh, I wasn't really sure I was even going to do another book. I kind of like sometimes leaving books uh, a little open ended, something mm -hmm. something the reader can sort of dwell on. Um, however. Uh, as much as I liked how how much book and uh, one ended up, yeah, I revisited it, and uh, frankly, the second book really really came together quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You must have had some ideas that just didn't make it into the first book. That that happens sometimes, and uh, you actually hit on a good point there. A lot of life is unresolved, and so when we get into our fiction, leaving some things unresolved is not always a bad thing. Yeah, I think so too. <clears throat> However, in the end, uh, yeah, it just uh, the characters were still talking in my head. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you got to get them onto paper. Yeah, exactly. That's the way that works. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned you mentioned earlier work prior to insurrection. Um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, what else you may have done? Yeah, sure. Um, the trilogy. Uh, 
the Judas Syndrome uh, is about uh, a group of kids, um, you know, 18-year-olds uh, who end up uh, sort of stranded um, in an apocalyptic uh, scenario. And, and that's a book that I thought I'd finished. And then after, you know, reviews and, and hearing people asking, um, I decided to do a second book and then I did a third. So that one became a trilogy. Other than that, I, I went to... Uh, I did some young reader fantasy, mm -hmm. um, and I did a sort of a a, a paranormal type novel um, called Her Past Present, and I did three more kids books. Uh, one that came out not long before AI Insurrection was called uh, The Ang An Angry Earth, mm -hmm. which I also illustrated. Um, and uh, yeah, so then I'm then I'm. Now I'm back into some sci-fi, though I did do a book as well, um, Waning Metaphorically, which was uh, 14 short stories of, of multiple genres. Mm-hmm. Winning Metaphorically, that's called? Waning. Waning. Waning Metaphorically. Okay, thank you. Sorry for my, my hearing there. Um, the Angry Earth. Tell me about that. That's a kind of a title that grabs Thanks. my ears. Yeah. <clears throat> An Angry Earth is, uh, is uh, sort of a, a cautionary tale about uh, ignorance and, and the end of the world. And uh, it's a bit of a bold, uh, a bold project when you consider it's meant for children. Um, but it's, it's pretty bleak and it uh, sort of tells it like it is. And in the end, I, I talk about uh, environment, climate change and things like that, which are close to my heart. And um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so uh, I really uh, really enjoyed putting that book together. I I, I came up uh, came up with the concept one night when I was reading my my daughter uh, a book, and then I I got so tired I couldn't really read the words anymore, and then I just closed my eyes, turned out the lights, and and uh, uh, imagined this book. And then uh, once she fell asleep, I ran to my room and and wrote down the things that I just sort of fallen out of my mouth. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then I just built on that and uh, and and then created that book. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds to me like you might be a bit of a student of the news too, though, because a lot of just from what you're saying, a lot of your work is quite topical. You know? mm. Yeah. Um, do you follow Do you follow current events closely? I, you know, I'm not big on watching the news, but I do have my the things that I like, and I and I tend to write about yeah, I write the things I'd like to read. So. Um, you know, I mean, I could do, honestly, just sort of a fluke in a way, but... Uh... Anyways, Michael, thank you very much for joining us on Dead to Rights. Do you have any tips for writers that you can impart? Um, well, I've been recently having some success with uh, with video blogging, um, where you just basically uh, pick up your book and you can read a, read a sample from it and then uh, get creative with your editing uh, software. Um, mm -hmm. I've recently done some where I've Read uh, read out uh, some uh, battle scenes from AI Insurrection, and then uh, I, I've uh, created uh, graphics and things like that. Mm -hmm. Company them. I sort of do it like a newscast, and I leave a, a large section to my right open on a white wall, and mm -hmm. then I put all my graphics in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and fun. That's a good idea. Getting creative with the marketing is. Um... It's something that authors can and should play with a little bit, I think. Uh, yeah. Try and have fun with it. Don't see it as so much drudgery. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the marketing aspect, honestly. Um, I'd rather be writing all the time, but I do enjoy the marketing. Uh, I create those memes for Facebook and, and LinkedIn and things like that that are, uh, you know, give a give a little teaser. I do the teaser trailers for the books. Um, oh, that's terrific yeah, that's terrific i wish i had more of a bent that way um my favorite part other than the writing has always been the research i can get caught up in that forever and i'm not mm -hmm. sure what it uh contributes to anything you know but it's fun <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah well thank you very much michael oh you're welcome thank you donna Let it rot. our thanks go out to michael for joining us today on dead to rights Again, his book, AI Insurrection, The General's War, is available for purchase in print or e-editions. Visit his author page on Amazon under Michael, P-O-E-L-T-L. -L. 
We have a short, short story for you today from 13 O'Clock by the Maydams of Mayhem, Carrick Publishing 2017. This one is titled The Test of Time, a flash crime piece by Melody Campbell. And you're right, we have featured Melody for a couple of weeks in a row. And the reason we're doing that is because Melody's got a new book out, and I'll tell you about that in a second. The Toronto Sun called Campbell Canada's Queen of Comedy. The Library Journal compared her to Janet Ivanovich. Melody Campbell got her start in writing, doing stand-up. Winner of nine awards, including the 2014 Derringer in the U.S. and the 2014 Arthur Ellis in Canada for the crime caper The Goddaughter's Revenge, Melody has over 200 publications to her credit, including 40 short stories and eight novels. Her humorous time travel series, The Land's End Trilogy, was a top 50 bestseller in January 2015, putting her ahead of Diana Gabaldon and Nora Roberts. You're going to want to check out Melody's latest caper, The Goddaughter Does Vegas, featuring Gino Gala. Gina is a mob goddaughter who doesn't want to be one. She's left her loopy family behind to elope with Pete to Vegas except that eloping may be a mortal sin in an Italian family. Between that and some weird deliveries and suitors, Gina's nerves are frayed. Vegas is full of great acts, but one impersonation is real. Gina has a crime-committing double whose activities are making Gina front-page news. Gina has to track down this fiendish fraud before the police catch up with her. And, of course, Cousin Nico is along for the ride. Another madcap adventure for the lovable Gallo cousins that proves the rule. Why should things go right when they can go wrong? I've got my copy of The Goddaughter Does Vegas on order, and I can't wait for it to arrive. And now, here he is, Flash Crime Piece, The Test of Time, by Melody Campbell. Another missing female. You'd better see this, Jack. Jack Connolly stood up from his cluttered desk and scowled. The third one in two months, and each case a dead end. No body, no witnesses, no traces of violence, not even any close relatives to grieve over them. It was as if they had disappeared into thin air. He scanned the details and saw they checked out. Same as before. This one was a 28 years old, a PhD student in engineering physics, whatever that was. Bright girl, obviously. That fit, too. He looked at the photo. Good-looking kid with shoulder-length auburn hair and big brown eyes. Nice smile. He continued reading. Used to be engaged, but broke it off last year. No history of violence on the part of the ex. No known current boyfriend. Girlfriend reported her missing when she failed to show up for lunch and shopping, Marco said. Not like her. When she didn't answer her cell or home phone, the, the friends started to worry about meningitis. There was some of that going around for sure, but both of them knew this wasn't a medical case. Any signs? Jack stuck a pencil in his mouth in lieu of a cigarette. Quitting smoking was hell, and he had to stop eating. The pounds were piling on. Not a thing, Marco said, same as before. Work? Hobbies? Not teaching this term, off for a few months doing her thesis. Took dance lessons, ballet, and likes classical music, books, all highfalutin stuff. Marco was a beer and hockey kind of guy. Not exactly a hot bit of criminal activity in symphony and ballet. Jack sucked on the eraser end. Who was taking them, and why these ones? All bright, all well-educated, not a single bar fly in the bunch. Toss in the lack of close relatives or boyfriends and it smacked of premeditation. White slave trade, his young detective constable asked. Jack shook his head. Too old. They target teens and runaways. He bit down hard on the pencil. Someone with an agenda. All lay money on it. One perp working alone. Done his research and knows what he wants. And he was good. Careful. God, I hate cases like this, Jack thought. Any leads at all, he asked. Marco shrugged. Her computer was wiped clean. That's a little strange. 
Jack's cop radar switched to full alert. He shifted out of the leather chair. Let's go there. I want to see for myself. Jack Connolly traipsed through Valerie Revel's modest apartment with a sinking heart. There was nothing, nothing to lay a trail to where she'd gone. Lots of clothes still there in drawers, a few underthings in the dirty clothes hamper. The small closet was stuffed with loaded hangers. A suitcase lay on the floor of the closet, empty. Of course, that didn't prove anything. She might have had a second suitcase. No messages on the answering machine except for the girlfriend trying several times to reach her. Jack walked back to the kitchen. Anything in the fridge, she asked the detective constable. Basics, Marco said. Milk, orange juice, eggs. Not a lot of cooking ingredients. Breakfast dishes were stacked neatly in the drying tray. The garbage contained a coffee filter, recently used. And yet her computer had been wiped completely. It was peculiar and inconclusive. Jack's heart sank. Here's something on the calendar, here on the wall. E-Galaxy marked on the day she went missing. E-Galaxy? Isn't that the online dating site that's been advertising on late-night television? That's the one. You think some pervert was stalking her online? Jack gazed out the window at the growing twilight. What's her name again? Valerie Revel? Pretty. Well, Valerie, darling, where the hell are you? He muttered. Valerie felt sick. Lights were flickering and her head hurt. Somewhere a machine hummed a pleasant drone. Vital signs look okay. I think she's coming out of it. Her eyes blinked open. Valerie looked around and immediately began an environmental assessment, second nature from years of engineering training. She appeared to be lying on a soft white leatherette bench against one wall of a scientific lab. The far wall housed a floor-to-ceiling unit of electronic equipment that spanned a good ten feet. The equipment was obviously cutting edge. Emotions confused her at the best of times, but it was hard to be frightened in such a familiar environment. Instead, she had the sudden urge to leap up and examine the new equipment. There she is, a pleasant female voice said. Don't be frightened. You're going to be fine. Valerie tried to sit up, but the nausea rose quickly. She lay her head back down and tried to focus. The letters E-Galaxy were displayed on the ceiling above her head in gold. Below them ran a sentence in smaller font. Will your love stand the test of time? Don't try to get up yet. You'll feel woozy for a few minutes. Take it easy. The voice came from a pretty, middle-aged woman in a white lab coat. She was slender with mocha skin, long brown hair and hazel eyes. She looked harmless. Can you tell me your name, she asked. That was easy. Valerie Revel. Do you know what year it is? 2015. Were they testing for a concussion? That's the year you just came from. Do you know which year it is here? Oh, Valerie remembered now. She remembered all of it. 2260. Perfect. My name is Petra. Do you know why you're here, Valerie? Valerie felt her heart lurch. Yes, I remember. Is he here? The brown-haired woman tilted her head. Behind the sliding glass doors, right over there. But before we go any further, I need to remind you that you can go back home any time, free of charge in the next 30 days. We guarantee that. Valerie glanced anxiously at the doors. E-Galaxy was sandblasted into the glass. Do many people do that? She had to ask. Petra smiled. No one yet. Our matching technique is almost foolproof, and of course we have centuries to pull from. The only thing we can't check for is severe homesickness, but if that happens, we can try sending the two of you back to your time. Haven't had to do it yet, though. Valerie rose gracefully to her feet. Thank you. Thank you so much. May I see him now? Of course, dear. He's been waiting for you. I hope you like flowers because that room seems to be full of them. Valerie didn't care about flowers or anything except covering the distance to the glass doors, which were opening. 
She could see him now, on the other side, the soft, dark hair, the rugged, kindly face, and brilliant smile she had come to know via her computer and e-galaxy after months of searching through all time for the man who was really meant for her. She was through the opening in three seconds. Jack Connolly followed his constable out of the shabby foyer and firmly closed the door to Valerie Revel's apartment building behind him. No trace, no damn trace anywhere. Where the hell was she? He looked up at the sky. City lights blocked out most of the stars, but here, on the edge of town, a few bright ones peeked out on a black velvet sky. Lucky stars? Caught by a fey moment, he made a fervent wish. Valerie Revel, be happy wherever you are. It was a cool night, but crossing the parking lot, Jack Connolly felt an uncommon chill. All those missing girls, said his detective constable, shivering. Year after year, all across the country, there are hundreds of girls we never find. Where do they go? I don't know, Marco, Jack said. It's almost as if they were sucked up into the sky. The end. And that has been The Test of Time by Melody Campbell. We want to thank Melody for this terrific story and congratulate her on her new book, The Goddaughter Does Vegas, which is now available in print or ebook edition at Amazon.com. Are you a published author? Would you like to be featured on our weekly Dead to Rights podcast? We're now scheduling slots for 2019. Please contact me at carrotpublishing at rogers.com and say Dead to Rights interview in the subject line. We'll love hearing from you. Likewise, if you have any questions about books, the book business, or the writing craft for me or for any of our featured authors, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Same address, carrickpublishing at rogers.com. You'll find us on Facebook under Dead to Rights or under our Carrick Publishing Facebook page. You can also find our personal pages, Donna Carrick or Alex Carrick. On Twitter, we're listed as at Dead to Rights Pod, at Carrick Pub, at Donna underscore Carrick, and at Alex underscore Carrick. All music featured on Dead to Rights, including our theme song, Eyes of Gold, is original material composed and performed by Ted Carrick. Look for his work on YouTube at Ted Carrick Music. Thank you for joining us. See you next week when we'll be bringing you our interview with Lana Webb, author of Lonesome Wolf. A dusty road, a man alone His vital signs go on But the years have turned my eyes gold And I told you what you told me We'd never be in the same boat for free Yet it rides Let it rot